So hello, good morning. My name is Dr. Juan Khoury. I'm a first year resident in the Department of Periodontology in Rambam Haifa. I was assigned to present the second step of therapy, which is controlling subgingival biofilm and calculus. So um, for the first part of my presentation, in the introduction, I will address some terminology and the goals of the subgingival instrumentation. Uh, the second step of therapy, which is also known as the cause-related therapy, is aimed at the reduction of the subgingival biofilm and calculus. Uh, naturally, the implementation of the first step is required in order to move on to the second. And the terminology we usually use or see is uh, subgingival debridement, subgingival scaling, or root planing. And in this workshop, they use the term uh, subgingival instrumentation instead. Uh, the endpoints you want to achieve are uh, no periodontal pockets greater than four millimeters and the absence of leading arm probing. The PICOS questions addressed in this chapter were based on Suvan and colleagues' systematic review from 2019 and were as follows. The first PICOS question is, what is the efficacy of subgingival instrumentation in comparison to supergingival instrumentation? The second PCOS question was, is there a difference between hand or powered instruments in terms of clinical outcomes? And the third question was, what is the efficacy of full mouth delivery protocols in comparison with multiple sessions? In the flow chart in the systematic review of Subin and colleagues, they began with approximately 5,000 papers, which were found based on a number of keywords, including periodontitis, uh, curettage, scaling, dental instrumentation, deposits, etc. Well, after screening and excluding, they ended up with 18 papers, which included the RCTs and prospective studies. I just want to note that uh, patients under uh, 18 years of age and studies with adjunctive therapy were excluded from this review. The 18 papers used for the systematic review showed mostly a low risk of bias. Nevertheless, when combined, it was determined that altogether they had a moderate risk, or let's say some concerns. Um, in short, uh, I just wanna talk about the grading system, which was divided into A, B, and O, while A was a strong recommendation and the direction of the arrows reflect if it is or is it recommended. And the strength of the consensus was based on the percentage of agreement between the participants. Now, um, moving on to the results. The first PCOS question was, is subgingival instrumentation beneficial for the treatment of periodontitis? This was based on one RCT with 169 patients and 11 prospective studies with 258 patients. It would be unethical to do a comparison with no subgingival sub intervention. Hence, the prospective studies were also included. Overall, there was a low risk of bias and the evidence was strong. And um, the outcome variables were pocket depth reduction, residual pockets of four millimeters or less, and bleeding on probing. The forest plot on this slide shows the pocket depth reduction at six to eight months in all sites. This database includes a heterogeneous group of non-surgical therapies, including full mouth or multiple session instrumentation, using hand or powered instruments and different combinations of these therapies. Overall, there was a weighted mean reduction in pocket depth of 1.4 millimeters. And furthermore, a weighted mean reduction of 63% in bleeding on probing was demonstrated in the results. A sub-analysis of the shallow sites resulted in a reduction of 1.6 millimeters, while deep sites demonstrated a reduction of 2.6 millimeters. Now moving on to the sites that yielded positive results, i.e. residual pocket depth of four millimeters or less, the proportion of these sites after subgingival instrumentation was 74%. It is important to note that patients with systemic diseases were not included in this systematic review. Nevertheless, Sands and colleagues showed that there is a consensus that subgingival instrumentation is efficacious in these groups as well. 
Most of the studies were performed in uh, universities and in well-controlled environments, which does not necessarily reflect private practices. Thus, the final recommendation was that subgingival instrumentation be employed to treat periodontitis in order to reduce pocket depth, gingival inflammation, and the number of disease sites. The strength of the recommendation was a grade A, and it was recommended the unanimous consensus. Moving on to the second question, are treatment outcomes of subgingival instrumentation better after the use of hand or powered instruments, or should we use a combination of both? This was based on four RCTs with 132 patients. There was a low risk of bias, and the evidence was strong and consistent. The outcome variables were pocket depth reduction and cal gain. It was shown that the pocket depth reduction at six and eight months showed no difference of clinical or statistical significance between the groups. And neither did the CAL. Overall, it was shown that the outcome of the treatments were technique sensitive and did not depend on the type of instrument employed. And the final recommendation then was that subgingival instrumentation should be performed with hand or powered instruments alone or in combination. The strength of the recommendation was a grade A, and it was recommended the unanimous consensus. We can say that in conclusion, the choice of the instrument should be based on the preference of the practitioner and the patient. The third and final question addressed in this chapter was, are the treatment outcomes of subgingival instrumentation better when delivered quadrant-wise over multiple visits or as a full mouth procedure? This was based on eight RCTs with 212 patients. There was a low risk of bias and the evidence was strong and consistent. The outcome variables were pocket depth reduction, residual pockets of four millimeters or less, and cal gain. The pocket depth reduction at six and eight months showed no substantial difference between the two treatment modalities. Cal gain was similar in both groups and the risk ratio of pocket depth under five millimeters was not statistically different between the treatments. It is important to note that there is evidence for an increased body temperature when implicating the full mouth delivery. Thus, it should be considered carefully. The general health and risk of the patient should be taken into consideration. I want to note that protocols including full mouth disinfection were not included in this analysis. And the final recommendation was that subgingival instrumentation should be, should be performed with either traditional quadrant-wise or full mouth delivery within 24 hours. The strength of the recommendation was a grade B and it was recommended with a strong consensus. Now, for the third part of my presentation, I will discuss the clinical implementations. Um, in our clinic, and I believe that worldwide, it is accepted that subgingival instrumentation is one of the basic steps for the treatment of periodontitis. We usually use a combination of instruments, yet uh, we do prefer to begin with the powered instruments and complement the treatment with hand instruments. It is easier and there is pocket lavage. Although nowadays with the coronavirus or the COVID-19 spread worldwide, we might tend to choose the use of manual instrumentations. Now regarding the full mouth or multiple session protocol, there are several modifying factors that affect the protocol chosen. These include uh, systemic diseases, behavioral issues, logistics, and the extent of periodontal disease. I will address these factors and divide them according to our clinical preference. Uh, for instance, the full mouth protocol will be chosen in systemic patients awaiting the completion of periodontal therapy as a prerequisite for farther systemic therapy, i.e. Uh, blood marrow, transplantation, or systemic bisphosphonate therapy. In patients in need for uh, over antibiotic prophylaxis prior to subgingival instrumentation, the preference is the full mouth protocol as well, and that is to spare the patient from several courses of antibiotics. Um, on patients in anticoagulants, we first recommend supragingival scaling in order to decrease the bacterial load and gingival inflammation. 
And later, later, the subgingival instrumentation could be divided into multiple areas in order to reduce the risk for potential severe post-op bleeding. However, for patients on systemic anticoagulants, when a hematological uh, preparation is required prior to therapy, a full mouth protocol is chosen. Uh, and in patients receiving comodine, which switched to heparin, the full mouth protocol will be chosen as well. Can you hear me? John, sure, continue. Professor, okay. Um, the multiple session protocol should be chosen in patients with behavioral issues, such as a gag reflex or low tolerance for chair time. Uh, logistics might become a factor when there is a time limitation and a daily schedule to meet. Furthermore, patients that travel a long distance should be taken into consideration, and in these cases, the full mouth protocol will be chosen as well. The extent of the periodontal disease plays a major role when choosing a protocol as well. We tend to implement the full mouth protocol in patients with molar incisor pattern or localized periodontitis. And on the other hand, a generalized periodontal disease directs us to the multiple session protocol. In both treatment options, oral hygiene instructions and patient education should be completed as a part of the, of the phase two therapy. That is regard, regardless of the number of subgingival instrumentations. Finally, and in my opinion, most importantly, the choice of protocol should depend on the amount of subgingival deposits, medical status, and the patient's preference, and perhaps the need for repeated sessions of oral hygiene instructions. Thank you. Again, we, if anybody wants to ask a, a very fast question. John, I'll ask you. Yes. You have a regular patient with a, a stage with a, a advanced periodontitis or the, a stage three periodontitis with no okay. real systemic problems. What would you prefer? Multiple meetings by quadrant or sextant, or uh, what we call full mouth disinfection or uh, uh, full treatment within 24 hours. I know you're a first year student, but. Yes, I'm afraid. Um, it depends on the systemic condition. Can you uh, be more specific or give me a no, certain example? Just reg a regular patient, no systemic problems. No systemic problems. Actually, um, it depends on how much calculus he has. Uh, if he doesn't have that much, that many deposits or subgingival, subgingival deposits, I'd go for a, a full mouth um, a protocol modality just uh, because um, maybe it's easier for him, but I will still um, work really hard with him on the oral hygiene instructions. And yet, if I see a patient uh, with uh, many deposits, subgingivally speaking, of course, I would actually maybe divide it into quadrant wise or sextant wise and actually work with him on the oral hygiene instructions even harder because obviously he's not working very well and not doing a very good job cleaning his mouth. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.